So the first time, the guy I'm going against is like a first-round draft pick. I have no idea. I didn't even know. I didn't even look at him. I, didn't, I was just trying to remember the play, and I'm hearing, you know, set hike. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> shit. Uh, it was a run. Hit somebody. And that's literally like all, that all happened so fast. And then I look up. I go to hit the guy. The guy's staring at me. He's looking back at me. I'm like, ah! <laughs> it was so. To this. So let's just say my first two years, yeah, football wasn't fun. Yeah. No, no. Being hit in the face for the first time, not fun. <laughs> right. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, Sharif here at SS Customs. We have our wonderful AJ. Uh, go ahead, introduce yourself, man. Man, you know it's the best co host with the uh, most out here. Your boy, AJ. Right. Don't play. <laughs> you are AJ. All right, AJ. And we have a, a good friend of ours who also happens to be one of our clients. Eric Swope, and he's got a hell of a story for you guys, uh, a.k.a. Swooper Star. <laughs> Swooper Star. <laughs> <laughs> On social media. Well, it's Swooper Star 86, right? Swooper Star 86, yeah. All right. Yeah. There it is. There it is. So make sure you go check him out. Give him a follow because you're about to hear some uh, pretty pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool story and journey about this gentleman right here and kind of like how he got started in his life to uh, – um, getting into some heavy hitting sports and and then where his life is headed to now. But there's a whole lot of stuff that will happen in between, <laughs> which we don't know anything about. So yeah. we about to find out, man. Let's do it. So Eric, uh, first of all, thanks for joining us. <laughs> hey, uh, I appreciate you, it. I love all of this. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm with it. I'm with it. it. Yeah, I'm I'm with it. it. <laughs> all right, cool. But uh, we got you in here in the building today. And um, what we know about you is your passion for cars. So you got obviously a, a pretty uh badass audi and then um Which your one? Uh, the one he parked with outside that you didn't, I see. didn't go look bro oh, i came I to get him oh right? yeah so yeah, he, he's gonna have to talk about that yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah, yeah. and then um <laughs> and obviously your uh your lady's truck mm -hmm. uh brooks truck and she's got a pretty badass truck herself so yes she does yeah. um we're but, a car loving family <clears throat> and that's how we pretty much met they came in they kind of Got their whole. Uh, your actually Audi was done once before, and uh, then, twice before, and then we did a remake on it, right? Yeah, yep, that's right. Yeah, but so y'all uh, just gonna leave me on the edge like this? What oh, kind okay, of Audi okay, is so, like, what's that? So, okay, all the suspense. Okay. Reason why there's okay. so much suspense here is because uh, our boy here he also has an Audi, and uh, so he's like, oh, yeah, Audi, uh, an Audi. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, man, far away. Let all me right, know cool. what you got. So um, I have a 2016 Audi S7. So I got it, uh, this was like the height of my NFL journey. I finally had like a little cash and was like, okay, I want something <laughs> badass. And at the time I was renting an A5 and decided like, okay, I was having family visit. I was in Indianapolis. I'm originally from Southern California. And um, every time my, my family came, again, I got a two door. So I'm like, I'm 6'5", at the time I was 265, living with my older brother, arguably my same size and oddly enough my parents are six foot and five one so <laughs> some size but not a lot so i need a back seat Relatable. so i was looking at panameras i was looking at trucks this and that originally all i wanted was a 911 but i was like okay young fella not quite ready for that don't really know what i'm getting myself into so I knew I couldn't afford a Bentley GT, but I was like, mm. the closest thing I see is an Audi S7. To me, it was like embodied everything that I saw in the Bentley, aesthetically wise, and was within my price range. So first things first, got the Audi, immediately before I even drove it, got new wheels, wrap, sound, everything, mm. got it all done. I started off in Nardo Gray. I got it wrapped down, spot called Exotic Car Trader down in Miami. From there, when we came to the Bay, which we'll get into all this, but I'll just walk you through my little car journey, is from there we moved uh, out to San Ramon when I signed with the Raiders. And um, on the, I had my, my car shipped and I didn't do closed container. And someone dripped fluid all across the top of my wrap. So as oh, soon as I got shit. here, I was so excited. Oh man, I got my whip finally. You know, I'm back home, I'm back in Cali, let's go. And I just have brown stains just all over the top of my car because whatever happened during the journey, all kind of issues. So I found a spot out here, got it wrapped. I switched it to military matte green, which I loved. And uh, oddly enough, had some other like, si like 
small issues there, but when I was doing my research, I heard of this spot called SS Customs, but it was far away and I wasn't familiar with the bay yet. So I was like, I'll find a way to get back over there. And that's actually how we ended up coming here is when my lady got her truck. She's got her 1500 AT4. And she was like, well, I want to go to the best spot to get wrapped. And I was like, well, I kind of been saving it for myself, but <laughs> <laughs> let's send you to the right spot. And that's how we ended up coming over here. And then now the color I got is next level. So yeah. now it's frozen ruby, Ooh. which for those who don't know, it basically looks like black with red speckles. And depending on how you look in the sun, it can look red, it can look purple, it can look matte black. And then I have uh, bronze Vossen 22 by 10s on there. So there's, it's got a lot of personality. Yeah, yeah, I'll put it that way. Where'd you park? Please tell me you parked right behind oh, me. Oh, I'm, I'm right in front. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got a little car show out there right yeah, now. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I'm right behind you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Here. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, so is that color like Sean's? Is it the, because his is black with a red bro, speckle. He had, he had a similar color. It was frozen. Ruby. Was it frozen ruby? I feel so. like he, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I when think I he came, did. He did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that color is so wild. Like on his photo shoot, like we did a photo where it's in, it's in the, you know, in the cat in a casted shadow, yeah. like behind a building. But the nose is sticking out in the sun, mm -hmm. where the sun's hitting it, and the rest of it's in shadow. It literally looks like completely different cars where the lights hitting it. Oh, that's because the, ass, once though. the light hits the fro the ru ruby, this is KPMF frozen ruby for all you guys out there, it just bl just goes. Crazy, bro, with all the lights and all the, <laughs> the, the chameleons coming out of there. Yeah. So um, it's a really very dynamic color when you you have different light yeah. you know, areas and light plays. So I'm pretty sure for him, he enjoys that quite a bit. Oh yeah, yeah. It was something that like, if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it different. That's oh, why yeah, I did up. the Nardo gray to start. Switch to the green because I was like, man, the green looks awesome it was right when i got my boss and will so i was like oh the green and gold that's a dope mix yep and then when i came to switch to rap and came here i'm like okay i want to do something that you haven't done with your clients let's yeah. let's do something that like you've been kind of saving it for a rainy day that kind of vibe but i don't want to be so loud because i also kind of like to hide in plain sight so i'm like i want something and this is just my style in general is like if you look a little bit closer yeah. you're like oh that's really dope it's yeah. not something where like you see me down the street and it just takes you over. It's like, okay, I like that color. Oh, hold check. Wait, it just changed colors. What is that? Yeah. Like that's typically like every conversation I do have about my car goes the same. It's literally that same way. They pull up. Hey, roll down your window. Is that black? No, nah, man, it ain't black. Is it red? Call it whatever you see right now. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah so it's fun. It's fun. Yeah, nah, that's, that's pretty cool, up. man. Yeah. And that's where the car culture thing comes in because you have strike up conversations with everybody yeah. for the same type of likeness. You know? I'm ready to pause this is. podcast just so I can walk just out. Just go out <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, this ain't fair. <laughs> nah, but uh, yeah, so that was that. And then Brooke was, she had a very specific color oh, yeah. in her, in oh, her yeah. mind. She was, came up, if I can remember correctly, she had it on her phone or something. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I took this picture in this parking lot and I can't remember where they were shopping. She's like, that's the color I want. And I showed her like, Maybe five ten colors. Mm -hmm. No, no, no! I want this color right here. I, I don't know, whatever this is, and we I had to like play detective almost, man. Was, like <laughs> Specter Gadget over there going through everything. <laughs> like which one yeah. is it? And then we kind of narrowed it down to like two colors, and I think we pretty much nailed the color that she wanted for yeah. the most part. So we we um, <clears throat> the color we originally I'm blanking on the name, but it had been discontinued, and it was the it was a, a color that we really liked, and then we ended up going with Phantom Black. And she, she wanted to do matte black. That was a big thing. But she was like, she, she felt the same kind of to myself. It was like, I want something that's custom but tasteful because she's 5'3", hairstylist, beautiful woman, but she also rides horses. She used to wrestle growing up. She wanted to be a UFC fighter. So she's got multiple layers. That's why I'm marrying this woman. I love this woman to death. And her biggest thing was same. Like, I want something when you look at it, you see something and it takes you on like a little bit of like a journey for your eyes. That's the same thing she does with her clients. Yeah. So she's like, I want that reflection in my truck, but I also want a badass truck. Like, <laughs> let's just be frank. And I'm like, all right, cool, let's do it. So yeah, we came in, shoot, like three, four times. We were looking at colors, then we would go back. You sent us color palettes, all this stuff. And then she liked the Phantom Black because it did have like a little bit of a gold hue where when the sun hits it and still now to this day when we clean the truck, 
it's the same. It's like it's not that flat black. Like we were looking at basalt black, which had the silver undertones. It was all these different like undertones, different shades of black that we were trying to dive into. And uh, phantom black by far was just is our favorite. Yeah, I want to say it was a color that you guys was the, the discontinued color was made by KPMF, designed yeah. by um, uh, by one of my friends, Kevin, called Bayou Black. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. it was out of New Orleans. That's what I remember. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bayou Black. That's what it was. Um. And and uh, <laughs> it came out really really good. I used it on a lot of cars. It was one of my best selling colors when it came out. But um, they discontinued it, and then they have colors that are very similar, like Satin Pearl Nero mm, uh, or yeah, the Metro yeah. Nero, yeah. Um, but they were just a little too grayish. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then you had the closest we can get to a black with like kind of like a bronze, excuse me, undertone was, I want to say Phantom. Yeah, it was. And yeah. I think she was, I hope she was pleasantly surprised with it when she picked it up. Like, okay. Oh, cool. no, she yeah. was. She right. was. She, the amount of pride she has in the way that vehicle looks is. It's everything. And then on top of that, like I said, we, we have horses. So we have our trailer and the truck and trailer combo when we're going out and doing our thing. Not that we're trying to showboat, but it's just like, yeah, we put some thought into this. Yeah. Just, just make sure you know when you see us like, yeah, you know, you go about your life. And that's like the fun thing with cars, right? Is it, you can have it as an expression of who you are. And that's kind of what we've done with our car journey up to this date is we want to have something that is beautiful is practical for whatever our lifestyle is but we also just put our character a little bit of a tap into that and then work with folks like yourself to say okay how do we do this in a way that not only looks nice but is also tasteful oh yeah you know and i appreciate that man i appreciate you choosing us <laughs> a little to shout out <laughs> and, uh, and and you know and working with us and uh we hope to be able to keep ranching and working on your cars going to the future. So there's a story of Eric Swope, right? Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah. Okay, did. cool. Because I've always been saying Swope. <laughs> it's all good. Now you know it's the Swoper star, bro. Come on, it's the Swoper star. <laughs> I'm still going to say Swoper star, okay? <laughs> hey, I'm with it. Like I said, as but, long as you know me, we're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> but uh, obviously there's, there's uh, you know, you've had a pretty wild journey in your life. And growing up as Eric, and then getting into, you know, obviously school and stuff. Uh, how was that journey? What life lessons did you have that were critical from, you know, growing up as a kid to getting to the point of, you know, jumping into, you know, like a, a college? Yeah. So, I mean, there's plenty of places to start. But the, the simple way is so I was born in Inglewood. I moved out to a city called Lake Elsinore, which is about 75 miles outside the city. Uh, we moved out in 94 because at the time uh, where I was growing up was like the height of gang violence, the height of rioting that was happening in L.A. And my mom, she's from Detroit. And even though she was from, I'd say, not like an upper class area, she had never been exposed to that amount of violence. And she's like, look, I got two young boys here. This is just not the way that we're going to be raised. So, you know, I, I love my dad for it. We moved far away with that intention of it being safe and us being able to do whatever we want to do with our lives. So we moved all the way out there and kind of what stimulated from that journey is my family. They had one specific rule. If you try something, you got to see it all the way through. So I fell in love with sports growing up. The Lakers were everything. Um, watching Shaq and Kobe. Shaq was like my idol hey, growing up. He was bro. he was Man, his movies, everything. everything. I was a fan. It didn't matter. As a kid, <laughs> and all his dude. rapping. What's Yo, up? <laughs> his rapping. <laughs> you know, speaking of basketball, with Shaq, what was that movie? He was like, he had this like metal suit on and shit. Oh, because uh, uh, I keep thinking Kazam when he was a genie. Nah, oh, nah. what's the, um, oh, it's on the Bro, I used to love that movie yes, growing up, bro. same, same. Oh, man, I had it on VHS, all that. Look, he's like, wait a minute, I got to go buy this movie. <laughs> I'm, it's killing me that it's not on the top of my mind. But, um. He was uh, a superhero, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I think of him like Black Robocop. Yeah, for, pretty much, man. <laughs> yeah. That was a great movie, man. Yeah. Growing up, or at least from what I can remember as a kid, like watching oh, it, it was. I it bet was if we awesome. rewatched it, it'd be hilarious. Yeah. But at the time, that was everything I yeah. needed to see. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> you a <alive>. lie. <laughs> Bro. What, what was it called? What's it called? Yeah, Shaq Steel. Steel. There that's you go. what it was. It's called Steel. Steel man. That's what it was. Yeah. That's dope, bro. You gotta watch it, bro. Don't don't knock it until you hey, watch it, bro. Yeah, man. Tune in. <laughs> oh my god. But anyways, bro. you had you had you were, you you loved yeah, it, like yeah. Kobe. And yeah, Shaq yeah. So and I, so I started to fall in love with sports. I actually I started with <laughs> soccer. Um, quickly fell in love with basketball. And to put in perspective, by the time I was 
11. I was like already 6'1", 6'2", with a size 13 shoe. So it was like, <laughs> let's just say my journey was kind of starting to, to form very quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, funny story I always tell, but the way I ended up choosing basketball instead of soccer was I had a soccer tryout on a Friday, basketball was on Saturday. The soccer tryout, the entry fee was 180 bucks that we did not have. The Saturday basketball trial was free. There it is. And there it is. You know, it's always complicated. Yeah. So long story short, I, uh, I ended up playing travel basketball, AAU basketball. And the, the cool thing that was happening and, and where I'm still so thankful to my family is I started doing well pretty early. And I grew up basically playing basketball with my dad and my brother. I always wanted to play up. I always wanted to. I, I felt like as much as I enjoy playing with my friends, I'm seeking a challenge. I'm seeking something greater. And I always wanted that. So when I started playing AAU basketball, I got pushed to play at, you know, older teams, playing with older guys. And uh, from that, I got onto a team that was out in Los Angeles. And to the kindness of my family's heart, we practiced three days a week at a Westchester High School, which was 75 miles away. And we were there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we played tournaments all through the weekend, six plus games. And my family was present at all of that. And that's what made me feel like, Yo, that's a support system right, right there. That's support great. and and hey, you know as a kid, you guys are watching. <laughs> but you know, as a kid, you don't know that you're just yeah. like, hey, we're all having fun. You're not realizing that hey, a family's actually sacrificing all of their precious free time. Seventy five miles a day. Seventy five miles bro. one way. Yeah. Oh my one god. One way. I'm bro. not saying total journey. I'm saying to get to practice, not to get home. So they they drove 150 miles a day for no. three days a week. And no traffic not, you're looking at a little over an hour yeah, yeah. no traffic two yeah. and a half hours was typically like yeah. practice was let's just call it 5 30. i got out of school at two we on the road by 2 45. yeah and that so was like traffic time oh yeah so. oh yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i know la way too well because that was when there wasn't no iphone so we had map quest so oh, yeah hey, i had to yeah, really yeah, learn the roads yeah, you know what i mean like we had to print you out took that thing back bro <laughs> <laughs> map quest yeah man, man. we yeah. had to shoot so i had to really learn the city because i sat in the front because this was my thing so i was like all right you ain't going to sleep yeah direct mm -hmm. us we going to your thing so take us where we gonna go so long story short all of that all those games, all those opportunities, I ended up linking with a group of guys that went to this school in LA that was called Harvard Westlake. Never heard of it, knew nothing about it. Harvard Westlake is the number one day school, meaning non boarding school in the United States. So it's the third best high school in all of the country, but the number one day school to go to that I had never heard of, didn't know it was right in the heart of LA. And the people that go there when I was there was baseball owners, billionaires, all these different types of people, oh, wow. the highest of the high of what I would consider high society in LA. And that's where, for me, I got exposed to, you know, growing up in the inner city, moving out, and now being exposed to the socioeconomic levels, that there's real levels to these things. And like, mm -hmm understanding that and then also meeting folks that are in these pinnacles of society and they are normal people mm -hmm. they just want time they want friendships they want you know different relationships they want to just hang they want to get to know people it has you know as much as there are business transactions that are happening we want to see our next generation succeed at a level that we didn't and that's what i got exposed to when i got to harvard westlake is we had to go through a full, you know, process. It was everything from interviews to a four and a half hour exam, in person interviews. There was all these things to get in the school. And the tuition in two thousand six was, I think, seventeen or twenty one thousand bucks a year to get into the school. So I was on scholarship. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just put that out there right now. Um, and what that opportunity did is it changed my whole perspective on life it's the reason why we're sitting here having this conversation was the four years that i spent at that school that's amazing that yeah. is pretty wild man. yeah how'd you get your foot in the door again so it started with some of my teammates we were enjoying our aau circuit you know we were playing all around the country at the time and uh we're just like you know can we keep this going you know my dream as a i don't know five-year-old was hey i want to play varsity basketball as a freshman and how can I do that and do that with people that I like? And actually we have some camaraderie and 
the conversation was very quick, like, hey, you can come to the school, but just know here sports is an extracurricular. It's really a subset to where you're taking your life. It's not going to be the, the focal point. And I never even had that conversation. So I'm, you know, 13 years old. I'm like, yeah, sure. Okay, whatever. Like, yeah. that, that meant nothing to me. And uh, going through that process and doing the, you know, everything to get into that school, they basically told you, look, you're either going to get a small letter in the mail that's a thank you for trying, or you get a big box that basically is like, you know, everything you need to get ramped up for the first day of school. So I would go to these tournaments with my teammates, and every day I'd come home and just check the front porch, and for the longest there was nothing. And then one day we came back, it was like just middle of a tournament, Saturday came back and there was a big box on my front door and I cried my eyes out, I couldn't believe it. I said, oh my God, I just got accepted to this thing. I don't even know what it is, but we live 90 miles from Harvard Westlake because this was another spot of LA. So I'm like, so how do we do that? You know, I had family in Inglewood, so I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go to my grandma's house five days a week and then home on the weekends, like what are we gonna do? Well, my family upped and moved us. Still can't wrap my head around that. Like now that I'm on the brink of being a husband and soon, you know, gonna be a father, you know, in the coming years, is like my whole family said, we're gonna bet on you. We're gonna move, we're gonna jump ship, we're gonna take, we're gonna uproot all of our sense of comfort to give you a shot at something. And that's where like, I realized just how crazy life is, is again, I have, Two parents working their butts off. My dad worked at an oil refinery, still does. My mom was a, a librarian at an elementary school. My brother had just graduated high school, was trying to figure out if he could get into college and things of that nature. And we're dropping everything for this 14 year old to move to the other side of town to just, ta just have a shot at life, right? We have no idea if this is going to work out, if I'm going to fail out, any of that. And that pressure as much as it was and that's a we can get in all that in, in terms of how that really felt but just I realized I had folks that are really in my corner and doing things that I won't even comprehend until I'm a grown-ass man which now I really understand and I, I thank them every time I see them I'm like you guys didn't have to do any of that you guys didn't have to to say we're dropping everything for this box that we just got that this piece of mail Right. That's all it was. Just a piece of mail that said, welcome, try. Mm -hmm. And like that literally is what got me into the University of Miami, which we'll talk about. And all the way into professional football was they decided, let's uproot that. Let's put you in this opportunity and let's see where it goes. Wow. I'm stuck between, man, that's love and making a joke about it. The baby always gets what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> no, for real. There was every feeling, yeah. every feeling when we got there. I'm like, dude, how, why would y'all do this? Yeah. Like, you know, how am I supposed to even be successful? I have no idea what I'm walking into. Mm -hmm. And then the first people I meet are some of the most highly successful people in the world, let alone just in Los Angeles. And these are their kids. And it's like, okay, before, you know, you go to your homie's house party or you get a little deal. It's like, no, I'm walking up to a mansion with security and yeah. guest lists and 14 years old. What, I don't even, you know, I don't need any of these things. The and hell like, did I just do? Right? In this what box? did I just walk into? <laughs> but, you know, you're meeting these folks and like, this is just daily life. Yeah. And it was like, there was so many culture shocks in that journey. It was like, what is happening? And I got to just embrace it. This is where we're at now. Well, uh, so that's a melting pot, obviously, of emotions. But it's also, you had mentioned something about pressure. Yeah. Right. And obviously, you know, one of the hardest minerals on the planet is developed under a lot of pressure. Oh, yeah. So gemstones. And, um, you know, for, I think, people to become somewhat great at whatever facet you need to have that pressure applied a lot of it applies to young people they did a recent i watched this video recently where it talked about a lot of people who grow up older and they they hit some level of success mm -hmm. and um, they try to figure out what are some of the similarities between them and other people that are in the same area yeah and a lot of them were was a lot of high stress environments, just the right amount, mm -hmm. not to break them, mm -hmm. but enough to give them whatever they needed to have some type of mental and fortitude when they get older or on their and on their journey towards whatever it is that they find themselves in whatever level of success it is. And it was a very it was a very common <clears throat> story across the board when you looked at it 
uh, with all these people that have different level, different successes in different parts of life. Yeah. Um, but um, they had a very similar story of the upbringing. It was a lot of, um, sometimes it wasn't the prettiest things. No. And other times it was just maybe a good story, but it was still a lot of pressure regardless. So I want to say that um, you probably had a decent amount riding on your shoulders for the whole family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that would be a gross understatement. <laughs> it was one of those things where, again, we've just we've moved 90 miles. We're in this situation we know nothing about. We just know that this place is prestigious, and if you succeed here, there's opportunity on the back end. No idea what any of that means, but let's just give it a shot. And that's, that's where we talked as a family. That's where the, the whole mind and kind of vibe was with the move. And uh, my first semester there was rough. Um, you know, at the time, Harvard Westlake and the history of their sports programs, they had had two kids go varsity as freshmen. I was the third. So I already felt that pressure. Then I get in, these classes are some of the most complicated things. I'd never really, coming from public school to private, didn't really know what it meant to study and analyze something. And the concept of office hours, which is normal in college, right? It's like, hey, if your professor's not teaching, basically they're readily available for you to meet with them. That's not a concept in public school. You only meet with your teacher if you got problems or something's not going well. So my first semester, uh, my first couple of tests, I always, I, the story was like a make or break moment for me is, so we first get there, I'm in my history class, I'm trying my best, uh, it's like a European history class, and uh, study for my test, I get a 62. The way Harvard Westlake works is if you go on academic probation, because this is such a highly sought after place, if you start slipping, it's not like a grace period you're gone, it's like, peace. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that. It's like, okay, you tried your best. There's schools everywhere. Try, you know, good luck. Exactly. Try another spot. Try another so spot. I get my 62, totally embarrassed, tail tuck going home, going into practice. Like, how am I even going to tell my family? I just did all this stuff and I might lose out. We ain't been here three months. And so I'm like, okay, next test, I'm going to try my best. I got this. Like, I'm going to figure it out. Study for three and a half weeks. I get a 63. I'm like, what am I going to do? Whole family's here. We just did all this stuff. And I don't even know how to pass these classes. I won't even be able to play basketball. Forget basketball. I can't pass these classes. And I walked into, we had guidance counselors. I walked into his office and I, I took my piece of paper, had big old 63 D on the top. I pointed at him. I said, look, this is not a reflection of who I am, my desire to be here or my character. And I'm going to figure out a way to, to do better. He laughed in my face. I'm 14 years old. He's like, yeah, man, we're not sweating it, but like we appreciate that you came up and, and just owned your mistake or your, your mishap, your failure, whatever you want to call it. And um, that was the first time I learned about asking people for help. I'd never done that before, right? I just worked my tail off, drove those 75 miles. My family, they were bending over backwards. I never really had to ask for help or understand that there's people that are a lot better at, you, better at things than you are and the first thing you need to do is humble yourself and ask someone, how do I do this? Am I doing this the right way? Can I do this better? That happened for me at 14 years old after failing two tests and all these things happening. Simultaneously from that stress, I'm now having panic attacks when I'm playing basketball games. It's my first time playing in front of fans. And as opposed to AAU tournaments where you travel everywhere and it's you know, your little cronies with you 10, 15 people, my high school, there's, you know, state championship stuff everywhere and you go and every game is packed house. And now, OK, I'm playing in front of 1500 people and I know all 1500 people. I could tell you like a couple of fun facts about every single person in this gym. I didn't even think about that aspect of that's where this sport is taking me. So now I'm having panic attacks when I'm playing. I'm failing these classes. And again, I'm three months into the school. I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do? And it slowly turned into getting to know the people around me, asking those questions, going to office hours. And actually something that I found very early was yoga and meditation, which actually came from my mom. Cause she noticed I was really struggling. And I'm like, my, I, I can't catch my breath. I'm out there, I'm losing. I can't feel my hands. She's like, well, just try this. It was a program that would come on at 6 a.m. on Oxygen, the old TV channel and the network. And she's like, just try this. The guy who teaches the class is 6'6". 
So he's your size, so it's proof that you can do what he can because he's a lot older than you are and he's doing all these different things. So give it a shot. So I started doing this yoga thing. No idea what yoga was. No, I, now it's coined and there's businesses and all those things. But at the time, it was like this show on oxygen that was six to seven. I had class started at eight. So I'm like, all right, I can do that and then go over to school. Started doing that. Started meeting with my professor. Started to get to know the folks around me. My next test, I got an 89. The panic attacks went away. Hey, yo. Everything. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, you got it going. <laughs> Dude, it was, uh, I still, I mean, shoot, I've been doing yoga for 15 years now. Hey, maybe you should start yoga, bro. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I guess I don't have the excuse, so I'm too tall for that shit, huh? <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> yeah, they've been telling me I need to stretch since I was yay high. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> can't touch the toes, can't do none of that, oh, dog. Man. Yeah, man, but uh, I paid to watch that first class, bro. Just, <laughs> <laughs> this man ain't got no flexibility. Oh, man. Those classes, man. I didn't see. I was doing them off like a TV program. I didn't do classes for like a shoot five years. The first time going to a class, I'm like, because you know people want to show out, and I'm like, yeah. I'm just trying to make sure I can do this stuff and not fart on somebody. Like I'm not. Yeah, I'm not even. You know, I'm not even <laughs> thinking about. Right. Oh, I'm in the mindset and we're working all these things mm -hmm. and like you know now I've learned a lot and there's a lot of passion behind it but you know that's where like to anyone who is interested in that it's like yeah just do it at the house man you don't it doesn't need to be a thing like I don't walk around and say I practice yoga yeah, 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 yeah like no my body felt better my mind is better so I do this in my in my <sighs> off time you know I may or may not have quite literally just received a uh, yoga mat on my doorstep today let's go hey. <laughs> so, oh. like quite literally there's a notification that says i'm from amazon so your package has arrived tell us how we did and it's a two-inch yoga mat yeah you probably bought it for some other reason uh, <laughs> but I, I bought i in full disclosure i bought it for like working out because i got hardwood floors in yeah. my room so okay. i wanted to be able to work out with it yeah, but, but now you can use it for what it's made it's, for. Exactly. How about that? Yeah, now it's quite, there it's just go. crazy timing. That's how late it is. That's how You got a yoga mat on your floor right now. All right. Well, it's good, man. So I will say some of the things that I've, I've kind of extrapolated from that is you, you had that journey. There's obviously there's a lot of pressure, and the pressure made you perform. Yeah. It was people you didn't want to let down. Yeah. So you, you couldn't just walk away. You were put in a position where you had to step up because people moved. They drove for years, 75 miles. Then they uprooted and moved another 90 miles. Yeah. And then all together, start to, you know, whatever inconvenience they had to go through, to put it all on essentially your shoulders. Say, yeah, we got this much faith and belief in this young man to be able to do something with, him, with himself, with his life, or just chase career. There's how much passion they put into their child it's, it's probably hard to explain for you even for you until you have a kid and be like oh yo i'm gonna do this for yeah. them you know what i mean you, <laughs> i know it's exciting to think about yeah but when you get there and, and that 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 enjoy that that whole thing is exuding in terms of that energy that you want to give to them i'm sure that you're gonna you're gonna pay that forward for sure for sure yeah there's the, i mean at this point it's it's <clears throat> you know it's the main thing i think about i mean you know we'll get more into it but trying to find a way to pass some of this journey and this information and this knowledge and this experience. Again, everyone's is different. And that's where I think it's so awesome that there's formats like this to talk about it because, you know, maybe it's someone who's doing really well and they feel like they're stagnating or someone who is trying to aspire for a goal was like, I have no idea where to start. Well, I could be the first person to tell you, just start. Like, don't worry about like, oh, I need to know the end game and work backwards. When I'm telling you, get it into Harvard Westlake and we about to get into Miami and switching sports from college basketball to pro football, I did not know the end game with any of these things. I hope things went a certain way. I hope that I didn't fail or let myself down. But to, to, to be foolish and say, oh, it's going to go this exact way and I'm going to have all the success and I'm going to reap all these benefits. Like, no, that's just not even how that world works being in sports and fitness. So the first thing, you know, is just go for it just go for it just make it happen just try you'd be surprised like you said when you when you put that pressure on yourself to say i don't have a an out with this opportunity or something that i'm i'm wanting to do i have to figure out a way to do this that's when you start to discover things about yourself and i feel like that's like the fun in life 
right? That's where it's like, oh my God, there's so much within this. And now when I look back and talk about this journey, it's like, holy shit, a lot happened. <laughs> yeah, I, will, I, I can I can see that being, being the thing. And the, I think the other thing that you'd mentioned was probably first was, was that, that pressure. Another yeah. one was asking for help. Yeah. When, you know, step out of your comfort zone, because a lot of us like to tread that path alone. Like, you know, we carry this weight on our shoulders and we can do this without asking anybody for anything. I, that's the way I've moved a lot of my life, not to not to put my my whatever aspect of burden that I might be thinking my own mind's eye onto other people. I just carry my own torch. But there is a huge power in asking people for when you when you really need it in the right way. Yeah. Asking for help. And I think that's one of the learning lessons that you had in that moment, which the dude laughed at you was like, yo, you tripping. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's like, you're going to be fine. You're going to be doing, fine, man. Yeah, I'm not about stressing it. about it. But to your exact point is like, especially as men, right, we're told we've, you go and provide, go make it happen, right? Mm -hmm. You don't ask questions later. Right now, just get going. And yes, don't get me wrong. That is one massive side of it. But you very quickly realize when you start on these journeys and these you know, lofty dreams that people are feeling very similar, right? I'm sure when you started your business and you're getting going and it's like, okay, I've got clients and customers and now I need to actually make these orders, like they're now depending on me. And then it's nice when you can talk to someone who's maybe been in the industry or owned a business for a long time and can just let you know like, yeah, man, I felt the same way. It was the same thing like when I got to Harvard Westlake, I had several friends. It was their first year too, because Harvard Westlake has a, a middle school program and a high school program. So a lot of the folks I was with had been in the system for three years by the time that I got there. I joined in ninth grade. And so when I started talking, they were like, yeah, man, it's overwhelming. We're all horribly overwhelmed. We just smile through it. I'm like, oh, okay. So I'm not the only one that's just feeling like I'm in the matrix. Like what the hell is happening? It's like, no, everyone's got their stuff. And learning that at 14 and then also having the type of friends and friendships where these people were you know, willing to talk and hear me out yeah, it made me feel a lot stronger going into these moments. Yeah, of course, man. The birds of a feather flock together, and I think your parents understood that very well. Yeah. They put you in the right place, and they were like, yo, you know, this is um, going to be for his benefit. And you realize that, I mean, for you, it was hit the hardest because you're living in that, right, in the <laughs> yeah. moment of it. You go to your friend's house, you got to do all these little security gates and passwords <laughs> and who the hell are you? And, you know, I'm sure it was one of those things where you're like, okay, I, I, I see, I see, like you said, the levels of this thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that was a, a, a big part of it. And then you played, what what was it? Uh, what'd you go to? That was your high school, though, right? That, this was all high school. We ain't even oh, gotten into where the, where the story gets thick, yeah. where the plot thick. Oh, shoot. Yeah, this right, was just right. like, hey, <laughs> we're just kicking the tires off. And I like to talk about this story because it then makes a lot more sense with everything that happens in college and then when I switch to the pros. So... The next phase in the story is that, yeah, so I ended up going to University of Miami. Uh, my dream at the time was if I'm as good as I think I am, then I want to play in the best conference in basketball. And, and, and my viewpoint still to this day, it's the ACC. If I can, because my dream school was Carolina, and I was like, okay, that ain't an option. I want to go to the ACC somehow, some way. I don't care. This is the challenge that I see in front of me and I'm gonna find a way to make it happen. So my senior year, I set a goal, small goal, but this is something that's very applicable to anything that you're trying to do. I said, okay, if I have five points a quarter and two rebounds a quarter throughout the course of the game, that's 20 points and 10 rebounds, that should be enough for me to be able to get a scholarship. If you look at my senior stats, I averaged 21 and nine. I said it was like my first time ever creating like a system for success for myself. I had the yoga going. Now I have a, a plot and plan that I'm chasing when I'm playing basketball and I want to go to the ACC. So I end up putting up those numbers. We won 26 games in a row. We set all these different records. All these amazing things happened when we were playing. And uh, like halfway through my senior season, University of Miami came out. I'm like, we want to see you be a little bit more aggressive. And I took those numbers from in the mid 20s to mid 30s. And uh, I actually committed to Miami before visiting because I looked at the school and I said, OK, you're top 50 academically. You're in the ACC and you have the most diversity of any power five school available. It's enough for me. I'll figure out the rest. 
like t it was like same when I went to Harvard Westlake. It was like, okay, this place breeds amazing human beings. I don't need to know everything. I just know if I go here, something beautiful can happen. So I'm just going to go and figure it out. It's a fun time. That's a good story. So you just took, a, you basically got the scholarship, said, all right, let's I'm going. do it. Let's go. Let's go. I ended up visiting later. Red light on. So you, you uh, and th then you go to University of Miami. You just basically say, yo, I'm, I'm doing this. We're going to University of Miami. We're I'm going jumping. to Miami. We're going to figure I didn't even know they had a good And then you took your whole program. family to Miami. No, I'm just no, no, I'm no. Just no. <laughs> At that point, it's like, okay, young fella, we didn't put our 18 years in. Make <laughs> it happen. Do your thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So college must have been, I mean, that's obviously a whole nother ballpark, man. It's a crazy place. Crazy yeah. place. Especially Miami. Come it's a crazy on, place. bro. It's a crazy place. I mean, yeah. outside of the partying and everything, I'm pretty sure you were a bit more <clears throat> well equipped for college yeah. just due to the high school structure that you were in. So Yeah, yeah. I would say that there a lot of people don't get that part, right? Harvard West, that's like he said a very elite school. That's what I'm saying. So And like, then you go there for, and then the pressure yeah. cooker, like you yeah. like you know you're yeah. talking about. It was all yeah. familiar territory. And yeah. like to yeah. to your exact point is like meeting donors. It was like yeah, these these are all like my same friends from school. So it wasn't a lot of the guys and I used to have conversations with some of my friends and teammates was like again that was their first time experiencing that type of pressure. That first time, like, oh, now I'm, I'm meeting, instead of hanging out with my boys and playing basketball, I'm meeting people in suits. Mm -hmm. And they're so excited, as a grown man, they're so excited to talk to me, a, a teenager, or maybe early in my 20s, and they're looking at me like, you know, with little kid eyes, oh my God, I'm so excited <laughs> to meet you. But like, you're like, <clears throat> okay, what is this? Like, this is so bizarre. And, mm -hmm. and I'm still just doing the same thing I've been doing since I was a little kid, but now adults care. Mm -hmm. Like it's such a weird place to be. And, and it was a fun place personally, because again, I'd kind of been exposed to it a little bit being at such an esteemed school that when I got to Miami, like, yeah, I was able to hit the ground running, I'd say in, in the classroom a lot faster. But what happened on the court was I went from a place where school was always above to now you are in the business of making a university money through mm -hmm. the vehicle of a sports program. So there was like a paradigm shift. I'm not saying that academically we weren't challenged because we were, I was an econ major and the classes were not easy. And I was like one of the only athletes in economics. So I didn't like you hear about athletes. Oh yeah, I just took my test whenever. And nah, it was like, you're a basketball player. We're a football school. <laughs> we ain't got nothing for you, bro. <laughs> it was like, no, you go take the class. If you have to take your midterm on the road, so not my bit, problem. Yeah. It <laughs> yeah. sound like a you problem. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what that got to do with me? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Take it on the road. Exactly. Exactly. So um, that was when I started to learn about just the business of sports and understanding yeah. that everyone has a job that they're trying to secure. And as much as team, when you're in high school, it's your friends, it's your boys. You have these relationships that you've had for years. So if you ball out tonight and I don't, I don't care. If I ball out, good for you. It was your day. When you get to college, one, everyone is damn good. And then two, now we're really trying to achieve our goal. Now the NBA is in the near distance. Now to this year could be my year or next year could be my year. So not really worried if I get to know you well enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, camaraderie, yeah, if it helps us win. And I'm not saying, again, my teammates were amazing. We had great relationships. We still talk every day to this day. But it was the first time really kind of having, you know, that, that culture shock. It was a different type of pressure where now you're making money on behalf of the university. You need to look a very certain way. You need to speak a specific way. My sophomore year in college, when we got the new staff that is now currently there with Jim Laranega and their staff, we had a no profanity rule. And I was like, you know, we're all like, who cares? He said, well, now you're playing games with sponsors, donors, millionaires, billionaires sitting on the floor watching you, the talent, you, your brand. What does your brand look like? Does your brand curse at folks? Does your brand disrespect people? Or is your brand competitive and, and takes ownership in what they do or do not do? So it was such like there was so many things about, you know, being polished off mm -hmm. the court that was like, I didn't know any of this mattered. I thought you just do your thing and, you know, and then they just assimilate to what you do. 
It's like, no, 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 no. They're, that's reserved for like one person per sport. <laughs> yeah. Right? They're, we can name the people in the <laughs> NBA that have an eclectic personality that are a very certain type of person or they're just a little outside the box. But now you're one of the many that are all at that level. So young fellas step in line. There was like a lot of those conversations kind of started to come up where um, and you're away from home, right? Mm -hmm. You're away from all your comforts. I'm literally across the country trying to figure out all this stuff. And it was the best decision that I made because I wanted to rip the comfort zone from underneath myself and see, am I actually as good as I think I am? I very quickly found out I wasn't. And I think that was the best thing that happened to me when I was at Miami. Yeah, and I, every, it was like, it was like gladiator. And every time you passed the gauntlet, you had more fierce opponents. <laughs> exactly. Than you got put into. And so now at University of Miami, and, and you know, the, the good thing about there is very, like you said, it's very diverse, eclectic with the people, the personalities, oh, yeah. and, and you know what I mean? Different cultural backgrounds. So you can't feel out of place. No. You know what I mean? It no, puts you right there and it gives you the, the clearest, clean cut answer you're going to get, I'm assuming. Yeah. Like, all right, cool. I, I know which way I got to pivot. Yeah. Um, yeah. You could either go to South Beach and live that life, <laughs> which, don't get me wrong, it's a fun life. It's Vegas with a beach. That's what I consider Miami. Or you use the tools and the opportunity you have and try and turn it into something with the four years that you got. And there was, in my four years, like I said, we did a lot of amazing stuff. Just a couple of highlights for those who have no idea who I am. We won regular season ACC for the first time in Miami history. We won, I think it was 13, 12 or 13 games in a row, which that set a record for ACC. Uh, we won the ACC tournament my junior year, and we went to the Sweet 16. We were number two in the country, so we were the highest rated that Miami had ever been in the history of the program. So, like, don't get me wrong. I'm talking about all these hardships and challenges. It was a beautiful experience. I got exp – I mean – being in that level of basketball, playing where the whole world is watching and people are betting on you and all those things, it was, I mean, the highest high. It was the coolest experience. We saw so many different things. We played against, I played against Michael Jordan's kids. I got to go to Carolina. I had my best game there. I, my first ever starting game in the ACC was at Cameron Indoor against Duke and playing against, they, at the time, they had two seven-footers and all these guys, they all went to the NBA. I mean, like, don't get me wrong, this journey was and has been one of the coolest things ever, but there's like that behind the scenes part where you just assume when you see these players out there having a blast that like, oh, just everything is sweet. And it's like, mm. no, 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 <laughs> not yes. in the slightest. I can only imagine the kind of hardships people have. Even when you get to that arena, the final arena, like, OK, there's no more arena past this one. I'm here. This is the ultimate level of competition. How do I rise above all these other guys that are that, that fought every freaking battle and jumped and moved from every arena to the, to the last and final arena? Now, how do I stand out amongst them? Exactly. So it's like you know to get to that Kobe level or to get to that you know Shaq level to get anybody else who we look at in basketball as like legendary or legends. Um, there's there was a hundred other players that were fucking phenomenal. Yeah. Right, yeah. that were amazing, but they just, it was like, there's certain things that you have to do. And the amount of pressure that Kobe had to put himself in just to be who he was, mm -hmm. was, I mean, people are already playing at a high level. He was so hard on himself just to be even at the level he was at. So it's like pressure upon pressure, upon application, upon discipline, upon, you can name the things. And I think you probably, out of everybody here at the table in terms of the athletic world, know that story better than any of us would ever <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so. I'll just give you some examples. So growing up in L.A., the local talent, and this is just the teams we were seeing on a weekly basis, was like Clay Thompson, Kawhi Leonard, DeMar DeRozan, uh, Drew Holiday. These were just like, these are the local kids who are good. And then you get to ACC play, and I'm playing against, now it's five guys of that same caliber. And then one of the really cool things that happened that I wanted to hit on is – Miami, again, being a fun place that people like to go in their off season, we had a facility that was open to, to pros, to vets. So when I first got to Miami is when LeBron James signed to come to the Heat. So my freshman year, my first summer, he pops in. It's him and Maverick Carter. And they come in because they want to introduce themselves to the local university, get to know the coaching staff, you know, 
work the whole like pro side of things that I didn't know, which was build relationships and, and you know, get your name and image and likeness around the community. So he shows up. Uh, it was a group. This was during the NBA lockout. So there's Chris Paul, Chris Bosh, Udonis Haslam, LeBron James, a couple of Mike Miller. That was the other person that was there. And uh, he shows up, introduces himself. Hi, guys, I'm LeBron. We're like, yeah, bro, we know who you are. But still, <laughs> this person at this level is still taking the time to just be normal and talk to us. We played pickup with him for like a week straight. And uh, it was cool because the second day he came back, he knew all of our names, which like, I never forget that story because it blew my mind because he walked in. Eric, man, what's up, man? It was a good day yesterday. I was like, yeah, LeBron, it was a good day, <laughs> <laughs> which was like the coolest thing. Again, this is like 60 days into being on my own. And now I'm sitting here having a conversation with, you know, one of the greatest players playing. And then from that, again, throughout the lockout, Kevin Durant would come by. Kyrie Irving would be in there. Joe Johnson would be in there. All these greats. Sean Livingston, when he was trying to get back on his feet before he came out here to the Warriors, he trained every single day after our practices so i got to see sean go from like oh i'm you know getting my bearings back i'm finding my flow to like oh okay i'm like that and then him come out here and then ball it was like dude i, I can tell you for a fact this brother's done put his time in so it was just so cool in that journey so gotta I'm give a shout you, out to sean man such we, a good dude he's uh he's come by the shop here we worked on his rise oh, before bro. Yeah. Oh wow. Sean okay. Livingston, man. He's he's solid, bro. He came in. I remember when he came in too, he was like, We know who you are, man. You can't hide behind that height. <laughs> right. But yeah. he came in with his baseball hat on, like you know, we were gonna swarm him or something. But no, nah, we nah. didn't we just treated him like a normal, like, yo, bro, what's up? Yeah. And then I get uh, after a few minutes, he's like, All right, cool. So these good they ain't they ain't trying <laughs> ain't trying to smother me. <laughs> but no, nah, he was cool. And this is like height of like you know what i mean like they oh, win yeah. championships and stuff oh yeah and he brought his bins out here but he's a he was actually a solid dude and overall getting to meet him and a lot of other people that are your caliber you know behind all the other stuff you know when they're off the field they just want to vibe out and be it's normal people. chill man it's a job like yeah, it is <clears throat> don't get me wrong it's a kid's game it's one of the most awesome things to say i play a kid's game for a living mm -hmm. but yeah, these are just normal people doing normal stuff. Like, when I got to the NFL and I was sitting in the locker room with and you know, I'm like, oh, the guy's going to go and buy cars and do crazy stuff. It's like, no, I got to take my son to soccer practice, my daughter to ballet, and make sure my, you know, my newborn is fed, and then I'm going to bed. Like, I don't – that's it. Like, mm -hmm. on Sundays, we do this fun thing that the whole world watches, but, like, yeah, I'm just trying to just – live a normal life and i know i've now have access to this capital this opportunity blah 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 but like most of the guys and that doesn't really get televised as much because it's not it doesn't sell but like yeah most of the guys that i've been around normal dudes it's just like yeah i have this skill that when i do this and people watch it blows your mind so. yeah man that's that's pretty damn cool so you got obviously you you're you're doing some a major shout out to moms and pops man because yes. you're sitting over there playing with, hey yo what up LeBron? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. and you got all these other people you're hanging out with and then you're you know you're watching the journey of people like sean livingston everybody else who put in the work to get to wherever they're mm -hmm. at and and just the whole thing man but it, moms and pops and whoever else was behind you to, that was part of your life at that time that said yo we're gonna push you at that time you know you were sitting there and it's probably surreal as shit and you're like man I got here because of all the effort that other people put in and believed in me to get here to this point. And then that was just the basketball story, man. That's before we flipped yeah. the whole script. Yeah. But, but I know you're not done with this one yet. So so what happened from, from that point on? Yeah, so junior year, like I said, we have all the success. Everything is so, you know, we're at the height of everything. Crushing it. Crushing it. I mean, we were the most mm -hmm. vetted on team, I think, in sports that year. I mean, it was like such a surreal journey. Shoot, we had LeBron came to the games. Rick Ross wanted tickets. Meek Mill wanted tickets. Ace Hood wanted tickets. Anyone in Miami was like, yo, we trying to go to these Miami games because these guys are good. And we were having all this success. And then, of course, right after that season, what do you do? This kind of feels like a league moment. So most of my teammates, if they weren't graduating, they you know took a shot at the NBA. And that, for me, kind of through that journey, um, that's when I realized, OK, Again, these levels. I was watching these amazing players play and had a very quick aha moment that like, yeah, I'm not there yet though. 
And I now have one year to prove myself if I expect to continue to play or I'm going to take this degree and have to get a job. And at the time, I'm just like, I just refuse to believe that all this has happened for me to just do four years of school and just say, hey, well, that was fun. And I was like, so what am I going to do? And so my older brother and I, and my brother, shout out my big brother, Devin, is he had just graduated from college. He had lost 100 pounds Damn. in one year. Hey, shout out to you, bro. So we were both in the same boat of like, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. There's got to be yeah. something we can, like, we're, we're, we're seeing it. It's kind of happening. Like, obviously, for him, literally, he's seeing it happen. For me, I'm like, I would have moments the year we were having success, but I still was, it was my first time kind of being behind the scenes. And I said, okay, well, going into senior year, these guys have all left. I want to be a leader. I, that's just what I crave. I like being in positions where I help set the standard. doesn't mean that I'm the, the center of attention. But just if you're around me, I'm always trying to set the standard. That's just, it's ingrained in me. So how am I going to do that this year? So I, it was a bit of an overcorrection, but it was what I felt I needed. I started working out six times a day, six days a week. I was 245. I'm 6'5", so I was 245 at the time. I got down to 220. My body fat was under 3%. And I was just training like a Mad Max. I was like, okay, I now understand how this game is played how these levers are pulled and where I fit within this picture. So I'm just gonna shoot for the stars and hope I can keep going. So senior year starts off slow, wasn't getting a whole lot of opportunity and basically just had a conversation with my coach asking how, like clearly it's the same thing. It goes the same thing from Harvard Westlake. Look, I'm trying my hardest. You, I don't know if you know or don't know that I'm doing all these things, but just by the way, like, to put in perspective, if we played a game <clears throat> nine o'clock in Syracuse and we got home at 2 a.m., if we lost, we had, a, we had a practice facility that was next door. I'd wait for everyone to leave and then I'd go back and get my bag and we had a key card that could get us in 24 hours. So the guy, oh yeah, we're gonna go get some drinks. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna go get some shots. I'm like, I'm not trying, this isn't like a, cause I'm bigger and better than you. Just like, I need this for my mind. And I did that the entire season. And I had this conversation with my coach about halfway through, cause I'm like, okay, we're getting into conference play. And I, you know, this is it, this is all or nothing. And I uh, just asked him a simple question, just what can I be doing better? And how can I do better? And how can I get an opportunity? I'm not asking for playing time. I'm just asking for feedback. That's all I want. Just help me understand I I'm, I'm here. I'm, I can tell you I'm more dedicated than anyone, but that means nothing if it's not helping us win games. So help me understand how I can help us win. After that conversation, I ended up playing basically a, a normal college game's 40 minutes, and I was in the type of shape. I basically played 36 to 40 minutes every single game moving forward from the rest of that. I ended up getting on Sports Center a number of times, like catching lobs and doing all kind of fun stuff that God's blessed my body to be able to do. And that's where the football journey started. That's where it garnered some on some. So I was sports center number one twice in the span of about a month, both like one handed catch lobs. And oh, sorry, one was a lob one. I just like basically put my nuts on someone's neck and very quickly a scout from the uh, from the Denver Broncos at the time had reached out to my coaching staff. This was like early January and it's like, well, we think this guy has football traits. They didn't tell me this. So we go about the season, finish the season. We end up being 500. We weren't projected to be good. So this was better than expected. And um, I meet with my coaches and basically tell them, hey, look, I have intentions to play overseas. I want to keep this journey going. You know, I'm going to graduate. I could have graduated in three years, but I set it up so I could just focus on basketball at the end. So I just have one class. So I'm like, I'll get my degree, let's do this. So on the flight back, my coach says, okay, I have like a weird proposition for you and just hear me out. I'm like, all right, cool. He's like, so this scout from the Denver Broncos has been talking to us and they want to work you out. And I laughed in his face. I'm like, did they know? I haven't even like watched a football game since like 2001. And this is 2014. So I'm like, I don't even know like how many people are on the field. I don't offense defense like I tailgated to tailgate so I'd come in you know hammered at halftime like oh there's football going on and then I'd leave and like you know I'd go maybe cheer for a couple of the guys I knew but like I hadn't played Madden nothing 
like nothing. And he was like, yeah, I, I told him and they still want to talk to you. I'm like, all right, weird. So I ended up going back. I told my brother, he was like, dude, just hear him out. Just have a conversation. Like, what's the worst thing to happen? You do a workout and you just go back to basketball. I'm like, oh, you got a valid point. So I had this conversation. He says, I want to take you through like an NFL style pro day, bench press, all these different things, metrics, and then go, you know, run routes and we'll, we'll keep it casual. We're not going to like have a bunch of scouts. He brought his daughter out. Like it was real low key. Um, at the time I had this conversation, Miami was having their pro day and I did not want to be a part of that because I'm like, look, those guys have done a hell of a lot to earn that moment. I'm not about to just like hop in on like some, let's just try it out. Like I'm not doing that. So we picked just a random day, which ended up being Miami's last day of their spring ball practice. I go and I do this workout. I do 14 reps at 225, which in NFL standards, not much for basketball. Pretty excited. My stand inverts a 39. My broad is 10-2. I run, they show me how to get into a 40 stance. I run like a 4-5-8, which is not slow. I'll put it that way. It's not like the fastest, but it damn sure ain't slow. And literally after I run it, he was like, well, if you ran a certain time, basically above a 4-8, I was going to suggest maybe you just try DN. At the rate you're at, maybe tight end. And if you were any faster, I was going to say wide receiver. So we finished this. We do all those things and then we go out into the field and again miami spring practice is happening so the media is there because they want to interview the team about the upcoming season i didn't know any of this because the basketball uh gym is separate from all the other sports so i walk in see all the people that have been seeing me play foot play excuse me play basketball for the last four years they see me walking with a denver broncos scout with gloves on cleats the whole nine yards and they're like oh what is going on over here? <laughs> so they start taking pictures. I end up running routes for about an hour. I catch every single pass. Keep in mind, I haven't touched I, I seven days playing around with some drills. My brother played football in college. So he's like, yeah, just try this thing and try this thing. Literally 60 minutes of routes. I catch everything. I'm like, what the hell just happened? Like, why did that like work out like that? And then we're like, well, let's look at your numbers against other tight ends. Like, how did you do? Well, outside of 225, it put me in like the top three of tight ends. I was like, oh, so I might actually be like this. <laughs> no, nah, I'm not going to say like that because, again, I'm totally naive. But I'm like, oh, I might have a shot at this. Like, I, I should give this a shot. So my brother, you can look at my Twitter. It's Superstar86. My first tweet to the NFL, uh, I, basically, we, we had this idea. We said, okay, if the Denver Broncos aren't, if they change their mind for whatever reason, Maybe you can get a second workout. Like, let's just see if, if anything can come of this. So I tweet at the NFL. I tweet at ESPN, CBS, all that. I'm Eric Swoboda. Enter my name in the NFL draft. I'm like, no one's going to notice this. But, like, let's just give it a shot. Like, literally, we got nothing to lose. I end up, <laughs> after that, I do 12 more workouts. And I get interviewed by about 27 of the 32 teams. Basically, my phone never stopped ringing for the next six weeks. And it, it, like I had one class from like eight to eight forty five. So the rest of the day was football, this football, that. And all of a sudden, like this is starting to feel like a real opportunity. And I'm like, OK, well, I've lost all this weight. I'm in basketball shape. Where do I go from here? So dope thing about Miami is we do have an amazing football history and lineage. And one particular person who I'm still forever thankful for, gentleman by the name of Jimmy, of Jimmy Graham. So Jimmy played four years basketball, one year football, and then was drafted third round to the New Orleans Saints, excuse me, Saints. I met him his rookie year during his bye week. He came back to just check in on some of the guys that he had been, you know, just recently been playing with. Knew nothing about him. We had like a funny conversation because I was actually injured at the time that we met. And uh, he was like, we were halfway across campus and I was on crutches. He's like, you want to ride? I'm like, bro, I don't know you. And he was driving like a five series Beamer. He's like, well, you gonna regret this. Wow, it just hit it. <laughs> and then I walk into the locker room and he's like, bro, what'd I tell you? And we ended up, we had a small talk, cool conversation, but everyone when I was at Miami kept telling me like, man, you're so much like Jimmy, you need to get to know Jimmy. And I'm like, oh, you know, if, if I get to meet him, dope, if not, whatever. So fast forward, now we're in this moment and I asked my athletic trainer who is now the Miami Heat's uh, head man which i'm so excited for him that they're going to the nba finals but he gives me his number i reach out to jimmy it's a very quick conversation jimmy says okay 
So if you want to do this, the first thing you need to figure out is why you play sports. Because football is not fun. Basketball is fun, don't get me wrong. Football is not fun. You need to figure out why you do this. And if so, I work out at 8 a.m. and I'll see you there. Bang. It's hung up on me. I'm like, all right, I guess we're doing this. <laughs> and that's literally how the journey started. I ended up doing all those workouts. I started training with the guys. And, and to put in perspective to any football fans that tune in, the group that I was training with was Frank Gore, Reggie Wayne, Santana Moss, DJ Williams, Jimmy Graham, Olivier Vernon, and Duke Johnson, who, if you know any of these folks, these are Andre Johnson, one I'm forgetting, like one of the most formidable people of this group, Jonathan Vilma, the names go on. This was just the lineage. All these guys are all pros, best in the business, highest paid caliber, all these different things in my black ass. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'm in it. And they opened, you know, full open arms, let me into the space, let me start training with them, put me through the gauntlet, tried to see if I had enough heart to really hang out. But then they also taught me a hell of a lot of things before I even stepped foot on a football field. So my last little bit is I took my last final on a Thursday. My birthday was Friday. I graduated on Saturday. I signed with the Colts on Sunday. And on Monday, I was in Indianapolis, and I'm now a football player. That's literally how quick Damn, it happened. Damn, that's crazy. <laughs> it was wild, Jeez. man. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's Wait, crazy. say that one more time, bro. <laughs> say that one that more time. That was my – I didn't celebrate said, grad night or nothing, yeah. right? So Thursday took my last final. Yeah. Friday was my birthday, started the NFL draft. Saturday I graduated, walked across the podium. Yay, we're all so excited. Sunday was the final round of the NFL draft. I went undrafted to the Indianapolis Colts. Monday, I thought I had like a grace period. I literally had the phone call. Yes, I want to go here. Jimmy actually set me up with his agency. So I was so excited. We have this quick conversation. Can you be here on Monday? I'm like, I mean, yeah. All right, what's your email? Boom, I had a flight within like 45 minutes. Everything's booked. I have no idea. I don't know anything about football. So I, I was like, am I going for like an interview? Like, am I going for like a couple of days? I didn't know I was going for eight weeks. So I just packed like a weekend bag. <laughs> it was like, yeah, guys, I'll be right back. Like, I guess I have to go to India, like sign some papers. And they're like, I didn't know this. and I didn't have that conversation with them. So I hop on this plane, I show up and they just throw me right into meetings. Give me a number, which was 86 and said, welcome to Indianapolis Colts. Best of luck to you. And I was like, Holy shit, um, I guess I'm a football player now. And that's literally, it was right then and there, we were right into it. Yo, that's, that's wild, bro. That's this whole crazy wild. journey, bro, of like playing basketball, playing basketball, all the way led him to the NFL. Dude, <laughs> that's wild, man. Such a crazy that's journey. Crazy, man. Such a crazy yeah, journey. That's it just fell into your lap too like that Bro. like that this wasn't a plan yeah. like i said i wasn't a fan none of that like <laughs> you know and and all of this was just taking a chance like Dude, that's that's lit yeah. no that that's really cool man and actually it's cool that he's he what the hell oh he needs help back there oh. Um, man, no, so you see me over here on my phone a couple times. There's a couple mm -hmm. things. I was actually just over here taking notes because I was like, I can't talk right now. Like, oh, I just, gotta, I just had to listen. I was like, I can't talk. There's right <laughs> like typos and stuff for me just trying to like, do this and look at you at the same time. I'm like, man. Uh, oh, yeah, go to the bathroom. I thought you had to help on something. Oh. Uh, um, no, so really, there's just parts that I want to um, kind of reiterate to, to focalize for anybody that's listening that I found were like really important and then a couple things that I – well, one main thing that I uh, resonate with myself, but putting your, and I'm gonna work backwards here. So putting okay. yourself in surroundings, uh, putting yourself in a surrounding of other people is extremely important. So like yeah. you going to Miami, which just so happens to be the area where people come on their off season to do whatnot, yeah. do everything like putting yourself in a location to be granted opportunities is extremely important. Absolutely. And that's benefited you on multiple occasions. Um, and then to kind of like piggyback that researching the schools that you're going to like anywhere, like if you're going to do something, 
research where you want to go because you looked up a bunch of different stuff about Miami, which I'm I was thinking I was like I wouldn't have even thought to look into this. Oh yeah, because you're like oh well they're this good on this. I mean they're not the best here, but they meet this qualification. They got a good diversity. Yeah. They got this route, and I'm like. Holy shit, like that's, <laughs> I would not have even thought to look, so you taught me something there, like really, Amazing. if you're going to move somewhere, like research, try, try and figure out what, what's important and create a criteria list that really, yeah. uh, that helps. So that well, was, you know, I'm, well, I'm, I'm glad, I'm, yeah. I'm glad, I mean, that, let, let me just, you know, put out first and foremost, it's like, yeah, that wasn't me, that was like. Yeah. Talking to friends, talking to family, they're like, yeah, if you're, you know, this is like the biggest decision of your 18 year old life, you might want to know a thing or two about what you're walking into, at least so you yeah. can be as prepared as possible. And yeah, I, I got the US and World Report, like a massive, they don't, I don't even know if they sell it anymore, but it was like a big old like SAT size book and it had every university in their statistics. So I was like, I'm just any any place I get a letter from, yeah, just for fun, because I can't believe this is actually happening that universities are spending me sending me letters i'm like let me just see what these places are about because to me college is college like yeah. you know like growing up it was just the concept that you could go to higher learning was like yo this is like next level and then it was, yeah. and then you know i'm sitting with folks that's like no you need to be decisive and you need to have a plan and all this i'm like i do that <laughs> <laughs> Man, thanks yeah well and that's uh that was something that i realized about your story was that everything that you did had an evolution to the next thing even un unintentionally so like you going um to the school down in, in la yeah right so that had a evolutionary path for you being prepped for the educational part of college mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but then college being in there uh for the part that you weren't used to of how the creating the brand of who you are and et cetera, et cetera, that actually taught you traits of just like the work industry exactly. as well and that's it's, these are all things that you didn't even realize so every single part was like a ladder step of evolution as to like what's to come next without you realizing yeah so yeah. Well hindsight said. is like crazy like <laughs> <It's> yeah crazy <laughs> um no, he's, I was, so this whole time that you see me on my phone, I made like a little list because I didn't want to, I didn't want to walk rough that story, bro. I was just over here fascinated. So I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was just going down the list of things I wanted to reiterate for, uh, for anybody that's listening because I found was important. So um, one that I mentioned was the fact that he like researched the school heavily and like found out certain criteria, created a list of criteria of stuff that he wanted it to hit and then did so. That was extremely important. And uh, no, honestly, it taught me. It taught me to do a little bit more of that rather than just kind of willy nilly some things. Because I'm not gonna lie, I'm just kind of like wade <laughs> in the water every time. Uh, but then to add to that criteria list because he didn't have in it, but it ended up impacting him was think about um, the location of where you go and who else is in that location, right? So he went to Miami, but not everybody, oh, not sure. just anybody's in Miami. There's people in their off season that are in Miami that had a direct correlation with what he's wanting to do, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if somebody's looking into art or something like that, and you're just looking at, oh, well, what, where do I want to move or where do I want to go to school or where do I want to work? Uh, and you're changing your geographical location. It's like, okay, well, think about that. You know, like where are some other big names in the art industry that just may end up where you're at? Because mm -hmm. if he's in Cleveland during his main thing, where's he at when he's not in Cleveland? Oh, he's in Miami, I right, bet it up. You know, hey, Miami might work out some slight. Yeah. Uh, and then like how everything was just a, a evolution that he can't see in real time, but it's obvious uh, in hindsight, like how school led him to um, academic preparation for college. And then college led him to understanding of how you carry yourself and your brand uh, and certain work ethic things that was actually indicative of the corporate world but you didn't even realize like that's the skills that you're gaining at that point but it's preparing you for the next part of life without you even realizing it uh so it's really cool to like hear the story because you can see it maybe you can hear it in hindsight um and then also what i thought was really important some that you did was when you set up the structure for becoming um the basketball player in college and you're like yeah. i just need to make these many these many plays these many uh points or whatever each quarter because mm -hmm. this will add up to this at such a young age is impressive. Like you, you, that's a business plan, bro. Like you said, you set up the thing because uh, it's, it's important to break things down. Cause that's why, you know, knowing your end goal, like how you said, just do it. You know what I'm saying? Cause there yeah. is that part, just there like is. take action, Absolutely. definitely take action, Absolutely. but you can take action with purpose. Exactly. And that's what you did. So it's like, 
you you may not know everything about the end goal, but you know, like, this is where I want to be at the top of this ladder. What are the pegs in between there? Well, shit, I don't know every peg, but, you know, skipping a bunch of them, this one and this one, how can I at least get to this one? Exactly. It's like, okay, I know these people got these averages, so I at least need to try to obtain this average. Step mm -hmm. one, boom, yeah. action, right? So exactly. So setting up a structure, I think, was really important uh, in something that's really good to reiterate for anybody that's listening because that'll help you get ahead in many different ways. Yeah, and uh, just make it, you know, try and make it simple for yourself, right? Like, yeah. At the time, in the language, in the sport that I was playing, that all made sense. It was like, yeah, five points, that's, you know, maybe lay up in a three or lay up in an AM one. That's not like a big ask, especially if you're, at the time, I was playing on a team that played very up-tempo. So, like, the concept of two layups and maybe a free throw, yeah, it's like, yeah, that's highly likely that it's going to happen. And, you know, or anything that you're setting out to do, if you're, oh, I want to lose 50 pounds, and all you think about is the 50 you haven't lost, well, like, yeah, that's really daunting, but yeah. the best way to lose weight is a pound a week, or a half a pound a week. If you're being aggressive, technically, it's two pounds a week. So think about what that process looks like, and then when you start to set those mini goals within, you look up, put your head down and put the work in, you look up and you're like, yeah, I actually lost, you know, 65 pounds, I didn't even realize. Yep. That's like how literally how my brother lost 100. It's like the same that that goal setting principle is is how I ended up having to learn NFL offenses, which if anyone doesn't know, <laughs> is one of the most complicated things, <laughs> a whole different language, a whole different everything. Yeah. Let me just I'm just give you one little nugget just for you guys and for anyone who doesn't know football or is curious what does an NFL offense look like and they always make it seem like it's so complicated so you have installs basically a series of plays that you're going to learn that you need to then apply on the football field call it plays right so we typically had 12 to 14 installs for our entire offense mm -hmm. the first install was normally between 250 to 350 plays. One day, we, we got 13 more of these. <laughs> Jesus. That's install one. So again, that Monday, I get there, they hand me a book, they hand me an iPad, they say, study. How big was this damn book, man? It wasn't small. <laughs> it wasn't that small. Way. That and thing it was, was like, like this. Exactly. <laughs> and it was like, so young fella, You've never played, but we think you have a chance, but you need to learn this thing first. Best of luck to you. And I'm flipping through and it's just like, oh, 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 this don't stop. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was like that. It was like, and everyone that I was walking into uh, that was coming from college, yeah. again, their offense, let's just call it most college offenses, is more like 50 plays. Maybe 50 might be the whole season. The, all of the installs may be 50 plays. Mm -hmm. We're talking 250 in day one. And we got 13 more of these to go. That's, that's where, like, that, that goal setting, that, those processes, making those bite off as much as you can chew. Like, I started with, like, okay, so there's how many people on the field? Okay, there's 11. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there's 11. All right, cool. I got that. There's 11 on 11. Okay, cool. So, so what positions did they play? Oh, so the, 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 the positions change every play? <sighs> All right, I got to learn. Okay, what happens when it's simple? Okay, it's this. What happens when this person changes? I'm okay, now it's this. And then now you need to learn where to stand. That's where, to me, football is like a game of chess. Basketball, I consider a game of flow. You yeah. can just go out there and just kind of let it happen. Football, everything systematically changes every 40 seconds. So if you don't have the knowledge applicable to, to, to pick that up on the fly, you got no shot. And that's where, to anyone who watches the sport, and they're like, why did that guy not work out? A lot of times it's it's getting over that educational hurdle and that goal setting principle, the education, asking for help, all those different questions. That's when when I got to Indianapolis and went on this this journey, I spent five years with the Colts. It didn't feel as daunting as it sounds like when I say it back to you guys, it sounds wild. Like it sounds yeah. like I was literally just out here just riverboat gambling like, hey, <laughs> well, try this, we'll try that. But yeah. at the time, I'm I like, ain't never been on a boat before. <laughs> yeah, I'll figure out. I'll, I'll work the boat. I'll paddle whatever we got to do. <laughs> that, I mean, but realistically, when I got there, I'm like, OK, I got a lot to learn. I got no time to learn it. That just sounds like the story simple of my enough. life yep, exactly <laughs> so i'm like okay so then how do i make this simple how do i just chip off and the, the main thing is is 
I got to stick to this. So let's just say my first two years, yeah, football wasn't fun. Yeah. No, no. Being hit in the face for the first time, not oh, fun. I didn't even think we about that. We talk about that. Yeah, putting oh, on pads man. for the first time, yeah. being hit by a Hall of Famers. Yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, man. That's a, that's a whole nother can of worms. <laughs> See, I grew up with it. I played a little basketball, but my brother was a football player, so he knocked the wind out of me for fun. So yeah. Yes, he knew. I, I knew my brother played, but we didn't. We never took it there because I was never interested. Yeah. And it's different. Like they try to say, oh, at first when I when I was first trying to just figure out the sport, they're like, um, you know, it's, it's you know, football and basketball are similar. Like if you're pass protecting, right? If you're trying to block someone, you just cut them off. I'm like. But the difference is they're trying to run through you, not around you. Yeah. I know nothing about being ran through <laughs> by someone who is 350 pounds oh, looking man. behind me like that's my lunch money right there. That's yeah. my ticket. That's my, that's my career is standing behind you, and I don't give a shit what you're doing. I'm running uh -huh. right through. Like that, wrapping my head around that, let's just say that took some time. Yeah. But all that said – you can't anything you step into, I can't step into with fear. I'm like, yeah. look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to take my lumps. Everyone else is doing it. I know I'm capable. That's why I'm here. That's why I signed that contract. And that's why I'm standing here. But it was rough. <laughs> the first down heads oh, up, man. I mean, oh, man. That's one that's one wild journey. <laughs> you, you go through life playing a completely different sport only to get picked up. But yeah, I think, you know what? This guy, I think he can do a different sport altogether. You're like, nah, they just mess with me. And all yeah. of a sudden you go from bam, bam, bam. In five days, you're signed to a team and you're like giving a book, say, figure this shit out. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, relatively later, I'm assuming not too far from that moment, um, you're standing in an arena with thousands of people and upon thousands of people looking at you. Yeah, yeah. What was that first day running out onto the field with all those people officialized? So like, I'll give you two more. Which moments. one was more surreal? The one where you first step out on the field without, with nobody on practice or when the arena's packed? No, when the arena's packed. When you went out there, on, like, <clears throat> because we practice at a practice facility. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't been in an NFL stadium. I've been to maybe one NFL game in my life. And, you know, basketball stadiums versus football stadiums, apples and oranges. So we've been practicing, 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 like in this outdoor, you know, beautiful, you know, facility. But I still hadn't been in a stadium. So we're doing all this in training camp. We're in Anderson, Indiana, which is like middle of nowhere. And we have our first preseason game. And our first preseason game was against the New York Jets at MetLife, which is like one of the biggest stadiums out, probably outside, probably outside of Dallas and a couple others. MetLife is like one of the biggest. And the reason why is they designed the stadium so it's very vertical. So when you walk in, you feel like you're in like a dome, even though it is open air. And everyone arguably has good seats because it, it's not built out like a taco, you know, like a V. It's built up. So when you walk in, it's like, yo. <laughs> this sucker just keeps going. Planes That's flying crazy. by, but the planes look low because of the way it's built. And the first thing that hit me when I ran out with the pads on, the, the jersey tightest thing I've ever put on, these shoulder pads up to my ears, helmets tight. I don't know how to warm up. I don't even know what <laughs> sideline we're on because we haven't done any of that. That wasn't a part of, excuse me, that wasn't a part of training camp. So I'm like, I come out and they're like, all right, we're doing this drill. And I'm like, where, where I go? Go that way. I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's all riled up. They got the eye black on. Like, so many things happened in that first game that I was so unfamiliar with. Because, again, basketball's fun. So, you got guys, you know, they're calling their mom. Hey, I hope I make it through the game. All these different things. All these emotions. Guys vomiting before. All these different things. I'm used to being in a locker room of 15 people. Preseason, it's 90. So we got all these personalities, all these different walks of life, all fighting for these 53 jobs. We got four opportunities to hopefully secure a job or secure a job with one of the other 31 teams. And this is your first moment. It was the most overwhelming, exciting, confusing. You know, I, I knew nothing about any of it. And going out there again, I've been playing against my teammates. They know the plays. So it was my first time, my first time ever playing. We were backed up. Uh, it was like the five yard line. They called a run my way. I was trying to remember again. I'm still trying to learn the plays and the formation. So I'm like, okay, they called this play. 
is it is it to me is it the wrong way like i don't know i'm just gonna hit somebody and, and they're gonna tell me if i did it right or wrong so the first time the guy i'm going against is like a first round draft pick i no, I, I didn't even know i didn't even look at him i didn't i was just trying to remember the play and i'm hearing you know said hike and i'm like oh <laughs> shit. uh it was a run hit somebody and that's literally like all, that all happened so fast and then i look up i go to hit the guy the guy's staring at me he's looking back at me i'm like <laughs> like it was so so many things were happening in preseason games so it's not a packed stadium but it, let's just call it thirty thousand people it was like so funny and that's what i said like you just look and you're all riled up your drill is high you're like this is my moment Fuck, what was the call <laughs> like so many things happen and uh i'll never forget because my brother called me after the game he was like you a little excited out there? <laughs> <laughs> like, bro, wow, you have no man. idea. So, I mean, it gives me chills now because I just, I came to the sideline confused. I was like, I don't know if I did right or wrong. I have no idea if I didn't. The guy came back like, how was it? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it was, there was so many things when, after all that studying, and I did know all, you know, some of the things, it was like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I really have no idea what I'm doing. And, you know, I was, I was lucky. I got my opportunities in those games. I was on the practice squad. So basically it's like being, think of it like an internship, but a, a internship that pays really well. And my first year, um, it was, you know, I didn't know anything about the Colts. I didn't know anything about Andrew Luck. I didn't know anything about, you know, about the storied franchise and all these things. So my rookie year, we go to the AFC championship. It was actually the deflate gate year against the Patriots. So my first year we're stacked with all these vets this is my super bowl chance this is where i cash out and hang it up there's all these amazing athletes and we we go 12 and 4 we have this amazing season everyone is so good and so talented and so there was a bit of imposter syndrome that came in because i'm like well, how the hell am i gonna get an opportunity i'm still just trying to remember like what position is what and meanwhile we're a game outside of the super bowl like, again, where do I go from here? And that's where going into year two, I was still on practice squad. I played my very last game. Um, it finally started to click. I was starting to find out like, oh, I have, I have skills and I have things that I can bring to this team that others can't. And I need to figure out how to hone that because now that is my brand. That is my business. I'm a hybrid tight end an athletic tight end, which there was only a small subset of athletic tight ends in the NFL in general. So I said, oh my God, I, I'm actually in a very unique niche and I can create my job as long as I hold myself to the standard that this organization has set. So I actually was like uh, going into year two was starting to have an aha moment. And then I had my first catch in year three. I, I made the active roster. I played those four games. This time there was no fear. It was like, no, let's ball, let's go. I know what I'm doing now. I know these calls. I actually know I can tell these calls backwards. Week six, I had my first catch. Sunday night football against the Houston Texans. Excuse me, Houston Texans. Packed house. My dad was there. Can't believe what's happening. I didn't expect to play because I was just playing special teams at the time. And everyone literally, it felt like everyone on the offense got hurt. And it's next man up mentality. So I've been sitting there, like the first play that goes out, all week they're like, yeah, we would never call this play if you're in the game. That's my first call, Sunday night football in front of everybody. I had this big run, you know, run and block and play. End up doing totally fine. A few plays later, I have my first catch. So run a little play. The moment I catch the ball is like a run action. I like sneak out because Andrew got blitzed. So I like totally lost sense of where I was on the field. and was like, I don't know, I'm just supposed to go up and go left. Like I just, everything went out. And I turn, and when I turn and look to the left, Andrew's looking right back at me with his eyes this big, like, <laughs> bro, you're my only guy. <laughs> Throws me the ball. I didn't even realize someone was right behind me. I have like a play-by-play -play picture of this catch. Yeah. I catch it with someone diving behind me, trying to knock the ball out of my hands, and I start running up the sideline. And the only thing I'm thinking is, I got the ball, I got the ball, I got the ball. I'm not, I'm not thinking of nothing else. I'm running up the Houston, Texas sideline, like, I got the ball, I got the ball. Oh, my God, I got the ball. This is really happening. Forgot that people are trying to tackle me. <laughs> totally forgot about that. I end up taking my first catch for 35 yards mm -hmm. and I just get smoked by <laughs> safety. He just, I had the biggest, about the size of this microphone 
thigh bruise across the side of my leg. He hit me so hard, I did like two front flips. I pop up, I'm you know, full of adrenaline, yeah! And like, I got a picture and you can see it. I'm smiling, but I'm like, oh, fuck, I can't feel my leg. <laughs> and that was like my, my welcome to the NFL, like, oh, you're doing this. And the rest of that season, I actually ended up averaging uh, almost 20 yards a catch. I was like, I had the second yards per catch behind Gronk my first year because I actually knew what the hell was going on. And it was just crazy. After that first catch, we ended up losing in overtime. It was a tough loss. But I went back, and we were getting on the bus to go home to Indianapolis, and I checked my phone. And I got texts from all those guys in Miami, Frank Gore, Reggie Wayne, all these, all these who's who's in the league. And I'm like, I'm a football player. I got, I got real pros congratulating me on a job well done with this job that I never thought I was going to do. Wasn't a plan, never gave two shits about. And now I'm gaining respect from people who have been doing this their whole life. Like, what is happening? Like, it was the most mind-boggling, like, three hours of my life. And then all of a sudden, you know, I had to own it. <clears throat> That's surreal. <laughs> my God, That man. is surreal. <laughs> That's surreal. This boy's playing basketball with LeBron. <laughs> Next thing he knows on the field, <laughs> playing crazy. NFL but, with. And I know players. the play that he's talking about because I watched his highlights before we started this. Oh, you, oh, so, so the you fact that you smoke. just. <laughs> 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 but the fact that you're like, yeah, in my head, I'm just like, I got the ball. I got the ball. I got the ball. <laughs> That's literally That's the only thing. The if you see it, it looks like I'm, I'm locked in. I'm trying to make some yeah, know, great bro. play. I'm literally like, I got the ball. I got the ball. Just keep running. Just keep running. Just keep running. And then. Oh Bam, I get so, it was so funny. That's, That's such hilarious. A good I mean, those are probably great, great moments that you'll never forget for the no. rest of your life, man. Seen your first uh, now, first touchdown catch, too. Seen that. Yeah. That was fun. Up in, uh, up in Minnesota, yeah. That was, uh, an, that was the first game, anxiety-wise, that I just, I was like, to hell with it, man. You, you study for hours. You're doing all these things. I had always wanted to go to the Mall of America, and yeah. I was like, oh, we were staying at a hotel that was attached to the Mall of America, and normally oh, when, when you travel for, for like a, a road game, you're, you're, it's 24 hours, you're like in and out, and you have like a three hour window to just kind of do you, and then you have meetings through the rest of the night and bed check and all these different things. So I'd always just go study, stretch, do my yoga routine, all this thing, and I'm like, you know what? I want to go walk the mall. Like, I can't believe I'm, I'm in Minnesota. It was minus 32. I'm like, this is just so cool. Like, why mm -hmm. not? And I left my book. I felt good about my studying. And I just took like two laps around the mall. It took me like the whole of three hours to just walk around. And I walked into that game and was just like, I'm just going to play. I'm just, I'm just going to be here. And then I ended up scoring my first touchdown. I had three plays in a row. First time ever catching three you know, passes in a row in a, in a game. Consecutively. Consecutive passes, yeah. yeah. And it was one on third down. I had no business getting the ball. The next time I, like, literally made their all-pro linebacker fall on his face, and then the next play after that, they threw me a touchdown. And I was just like, what that a, high. What a time to be alive, bro. Man. <laughs> bro. I, can't, I can't even put it in, for, <laughs> in my mind, bro. I can only imagine, dude. The camera got you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> I seen it. <laughs> Wow. Bro tried to celebrate in the end zone, couldn't celebrate. He just started convulsing. Yeah, I, I, literally, I, I had a plan. I forgot it all. I was like, I, oh, man. It was just like. That was yeah. wild. Bro. Oh, man. Dude, that was hilarious. That's amazing, yeah. man. Yeah. Amazing, it's amazing. It's been a fun story. journey. It's Absolutely, been a fun, man. fun journey. And now you've kind of, kind of, uh, you're in a point in life where you kind of hung up your hats in a, what, uh, pro ball? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my journey is, is. <clears throat> It's a funny conversation I have with a friend of mine is life is beautiful until it isn't. Mm -hmm. So my journey, I uh, shortly after that, I ended up having a couple of knee surgeries, um, fight my way back for another opportunity, have a great season in Indianapolis. And that, that journey comes to an end. And then I moved out to the Bay to sign with the Raiders and learned about this gentleman named Darren Waller, who I knew nothing about, <laughs> who's now like one of the greatest tight ends playing and ended up being my roommate for the short time I was there. And um, I started to learn about the business side of it, that you need people in your corner. And when the Indianapolis Colts, when I was there, they had a regime change, <clears throat> excuse me, and all the coaches decided to go back to college. So I had no one in my corner. So then it was going into these organizations like, yeah, we heard of you as like this basketball playing tight end thing. I don't know. We'll give you a shot. And I was getting these opportunities, but my knee was so jacked up that they're like, uh, we're just not sure if 
health wise if you can make it we see you got the mentality all that other stuff but we're too concerned so opportunities started to kind of you know slide between my fingers and the last moment basically before i hung it up kind of what led to this this podcast is um i ended up going in to like a separate league. I just needed to get film. I was just trying to show, hey, look, I'm still healthy. I can still do this. I had gotten myself into better shape than I was even with all the things that we've talked about. And uh, three days into this this different league I was in, someone stepped on the back of my leg and snapped it in half. So I broke my fibula and dislocated my ankles. My first time seeing my body go the wrong direction. It was like the freakiest thing I'd ever experienced. And uh, at the time, I had been fighting tooth and nail, flying to all these cities, being told I'm medically not capable. And I'm like, look, I have gotten myself into literally better shape than I n ever thought my being could be. And you're still telling me I'm not healthy. I'm going to prove you wrong. So I went there and I was halfway through the game. This was early in the second half. And yeah, I got <laughs> stepped on. I looked down, my leg was sideways. And every emotion that I didn't know I had came out for about five minutes while they cut to a media timeout. Tears, cursing, screaming, panic, everything. I thought my leg was gone. Like, you know, just seeing your body go the wrong direction and have people try to comfort you. You know how weird that feels? They're yeah. trying, they know you're a medical emergency and let's pretend like, yeah, just, you know, Stroke the fuzzy wall, like you're good, you're safe. Hey man, you be all right. Yeah, you be, you be all, right. all right, man. Don't Pat worry you about it, back. man. Yeah, you good. You still got your toes, man. I'm like, dog. Bro. I can see my bones. <laughs> yeah, it ain't all good, man. No, man, because you know every single thing that you had to go through to get to that moment in your life, and you just question it. Ripcord pull. Yeah, and I I went back. I was on the EMT gurney, um, and I I called my fiance Brooke, and I just told her I said, look. It was weird because in the moment after all those emotions came out and I was headed toward the hospital, I just had a sense of peace because I was like, look, I gave it everything. And I knew that this journey wasn't the journey that I was going to do this for 30 years. I knew this had a finite moment. I knew that there's a shelf life on this career, on this opportunity. And like it just every all these things we've been talking about just like flashed in my mind. And I just was like, dude. You had your opportunity. It's over. And that's okay. And I called her and I literally said, sweetie, she got the news. My family was watching. They saw my leg go the wrong way. They called her. She was at a horse show. All these things were happening. So much panic. And I called her and I was just like, look, we got to move on. This is over. And I got nothing but peace with it. But I also need you to fly to Houston, Texas when you get a moment. But uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> Handle these bills for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I, got a, I got a little bit of pain that I'm dealing with right now, but this journey is coming to a close. And so that was Memorial Weekend of 2021 that this journey came to a harsh, harsh ending. I remember you walked in with crutches. Yeah, yeah. And you were content with yourself at the time, but if I could read your face, it was it was a lot of emotion. Yeah. You know what I mean? And doing what we do in this industry where you meet all kinds of people, walks a lot. I have to be able to read people to understand how they are emotionally mm -hmm. on what I'm doing for them. I'm doing a service for them, right? Yeah. And so I got to be able to gauge from the day, from the time they walk into what I deliver and how they're accepting it. So when you walked in, yeah, your crutch is on. You're like, yeah, you smiling. You're like, yeah, no, I'm good, man. I got hurt, blah, blah, blah. But there's, there's just so, uh, just this blanket of emotions that I know that's, like you're holding it back and I'm, I'm trying my best to read it, but you know, I didn't want to get too much in it. Oh, I appreciate yeah. it. I mean, it, it was, uh, again, there was uh, the whole time. I'm just like, I've been praying <clears throat> for a, a message. Like, sh should I keep doing this or not? I did not expect it to be so violent. <laughs> he got a hell no. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I got a bro. Hang it up. Your journey <laughs> is <laughs> over. But you know what? When you came in walking with you, with, with your little, I think you had your little scooter. I had my knee scooter, yeah. Yeah. My lady had one of those from our last Brutal. vacation trip. Sitting on but, <laughs> yeah, We I did wish. customize hers. We wrapped it and everything. That's amazing. For real. <laughs> yeah, our little tassels and shit coming off the side. <laughs> But anyways, uh, she was, uh, I mean, for you, when I saw you, I was like, all right. You know, me not knowing, 
uh, that much about you know what an injury can do to you and this now i know i know it can put you out but i'm like uh he looks cool he got a cast on he gonna he gonna be back on the field soon i had no clue this these are all things were already yeah. passed through your mind you said you know what so on to the next yeah you know what i mean yeah. so so it was like when i came here i was still trying to be comfortable with even saying that out loud that like it's over and this leg break <clears throat> is the reason my career i'm no longer going to pursue what's been my dream since i was five years old i was still trying to wrap my head around that on top of the fact that whole process i was on pain meds for about eight weeks everything from trimadols to oxycontin which i at the time i had never had really much of anything so i'm having panic attacks all these things are happening because my body's going into withdrawal from all these different meds i'm just trying to get outside and see the sun because i was in such like a dark depression about like yeah i got peace with it but i still have no idea what the hell i want to do with my life like i made it my sole purpose to be the best athlete and the best teammate that i can as much as i did you know tap into different information and be smart with my money and all that yeah that's that's fine and dandy but it was still like but what do you do when your body's no longer your business that's the conundrum that most athletes deal with is like yeah i had all these plans and blah 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 but when it's really gone and you have to ask yourself like so what else do i enjoy i i you know respect the hell out of guys that do have a plan but a lot of guys it's your identity it's everything it's your sense of purpose it's it's your sense of well-being was what you did to invest into your body and so coming in it when i came in here with my leg broken yeah i was just putting that mask on like yeah i can smile because i'm a happy guy but i'm miserable i have no idea what to do with my life and i'm just here and i have these things and that's cool and all but like but what are we gonna do and uh yeah man it was it was an uphill journey to get back to the the smiling face i got now let's put it that way well, you, you're in very good spirits man and i think there's um, a lot to be said about you know that part of the journey there is um something that arnold said back in the days uh, or something he said recently that you know i've heard before but i remember him specifically saying it that you got to move in your life without a, you can't have a plan b Mm -hmm. you can't you can't start planning a plan b because then your plan a fails exactly so when you know what you just said how you said it really brought that memory back up into my mind because you didn't have a plan b you were so focused on the plan a that you caught a touchdown in an arena in a big <laughs> stadium in a pro nfl team yeah that's what plan a took you bro. that was plan b bro miami was plan a <laughs> hey no 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 man that's 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 a, that's a that, it still all led to that because i thought about that too as you were explaining to me i'm like man you should have been training for football this whole time what oh, you talking? Yeah, yeah. but then in the back of my mind i was like no that couldn't have been because he wouldn't have had no matter you know it, the store could have went completely sideways exactly mm -hmm. so the fact that you know you took that uh, the story took you through this whole thing to get to the point where someone's just watching the tape of you and be like, this dude might be better playing football. Yeah. Let me let me let me go talk to his coach real quick. Yeah. And whoever that guy was that made that phone call to your coach, who probably caught him sideways and was like, <laughs> you know what? Let me tell this dude something. It made you laugh there, yeah, sitting there. Literally. Uh, to the point where, you know, you're catching a touchdown, you know, in the stadium and, and you're having all these amazing moments. <clears throat> um, that was plan A, bro. Yeah. And I don't know. If there's, there's any truth to it, but I think if you did, you had like this whole plan B thing you were playing on the side. Um, it, I don't know if you would have taken it that far. I wouldn't have taken the risks. Yeah, right. Cause exactly. Everything that I been. did, everything that I chose to do, came from an element of like, I really want to find a way to to reach this pinnacle. I don't care what it looks like. I just want to find a way to get there and earn the respect of those that are at the top. And yeah, I, I agree. If I if I had like a real plan B, that's like a sure thing that I'm set. I just feel like you know, in, in some respects, I wouldn't have put myself through what I put myself through because I, I would have known. Well, if this goes sideways, I still have this. I still you know. got this. So like, we're good. So that there would be that factor, that little gate in your mind that says, "Hey, you don't have to go all the way here, man. Exactly. You you got something to lean on." And, I think there's something to be said when you can't look left, right behind you and be like, I ain't got nowhere to go but forward. Yeah. I got to cut through this brush and get through it because there's no other path for me. 
um, that's when you do that without knowing it subliminally. You still have a, a college degree, right? So yeah, it's yeah. like it's still there, still in play. Oh yeah, you know, but you don't see even see that as no, a thing. It's just no. like I'm going, I'm trudging all the way forward, and that puts you to the path, you know, where you were on. So major respect and congratulations to you for your journey so oh, far. I appreciate it. And you hit that that point in your life now where you're on to the next chapter. So. There's a lot of things that probably process in your mind in the past couple of months, a couple uh, yeah. of years. Yeah. But obviously there's there's something there now, I'm assuming. Yeah. The so, next chapter in your life. Yeah, we're early into it. But okay. um so I, I, I went back, got a little bit more education. It was cool through the NFL. There's a program at Harvard Business School called the Crossover into Business Program. It's basically like a semester you get to spend around uh HBS students and you pick two mentors. You do case analysis and the the it was crazy to think all of this led to me and my fiance flying to boston to hang out at harvard because of football it was like it was just one of those like what is happening moments but such a unique program like again it was a semester long program and i got to just be around some of the brightest human beings that are in the same boat right they've basically to get into harvard business school you need to have previous work experience and then there's a massive application process but most of these folks if not all of them they've done something for some time they feel like they can take it to the next level but they're still like but but i don't i don't fully know or maybe i do and i just need this thing and this thing will help me get where i want to go and then some of them just realize like no i'm just i'm, I'm making this up as i go and it was just cool to be around such an eclectic group of brilliant human beings and we're talking about these interesting topics i mean everything from the rocks career to different things in fashion to pharrell's brand like so many different Same. things just diving in and um for me that that made me step back and realize kind of from everything we've talked about there's expertise there there's things that should be passed on that love that care that i got <laughs> from my family is there a way that I can give that back to my community? And that's basically where I'm at right now. So I've started doing some youth coaching, um, football and basketball, everything from middle school up to pro. And all of these nuances, which again, I could talk about this for hours, but all these different nuances that you have to create for yourself in the way that it speaks to you to achieve a goal, that is learned. Like all that stuff that I got was through talking to my peers, through trial and error and all those things. And a massive component of that comes with lack of access. And the reason I reached those goals, yes, it started with effort, but it was also I was in the right place at the right time, like we talked about. And if I could be that right place for somebody or to a group of people or to subscribers, whatever that is, to help them get over that hump or that hurdle, to me, that's everything. So I'm, I'm in the early stages, but trying to build a, a, a bit of a business around that. It's great. You know, I think they're, you're <clears throat> onto something there. Speaking of which, we got um, a, a program here locally that we became a part of for a little while now. Um, and we're getting more and more involved with them. It is exactly that. It's an incubator program for youth. Oh, nice. Um, and it's the um, size of maybe three quarters of a Costco. It's a massive mm -hmm. facility. And um, it's a bunch of kids, underprivileged, and people who are in the area um, that are going to uh, imagine this humongous warehouse that has multiple sports, football, um, uh, probably outside. They have, you know, the batting cages mm -hmm. and golf and simula golf simulators and uh, volleyball and basketball and all these different courts. And they're, you know, good coaches. They're training everybody up to full on weight sets to oh, wow. um, what is it called? What's that? Uh, racing simulators to um, ice boxes and cryo, you know, oh, they recovery got everything units. like this is all <laughs> stuff that the community is providing because they're seeing the, 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 you know, oh, the beauty in beautiful. it over time. Yeah. Um, and then the back half is like all types of incubator style businesses for kids. So, you know, can oh, I want to be a baker? OK, cool. We're going to invest into a kitchen back here. And build you a whole setup. Oh, oh I, I want to have a restaurant. All right, cool. We're going to invest in this. Oh, you know, I want to start my own apparel company. All right, cool. We're going to invest into um, T-shirt manufacturing machines and blah, blah, blah. So it's a true incubator program along with everything else that, that you know, somebody might want to get into athletically. Amazing. So no matter what it is, and it's for the youth, um, and it's just amazing, amazing group of people at the Limo Foundation. Limo, okay. L-E-M-O in Redwood City. 
Okay. But um, I think it's um, everything happens for in life for a reason. So you even sitting here at this table. So I want to say that uh, yeah, it would be good. It would be a cool introduction for me to you know introduce you to those guys over there. And Let's I think you'd be pleasantly surprised, man. Yeah, for yeah. sure, for it sure. Sounds awesome. Yeah, dude. It's <laughs> big really, plug really on camera really right there. Like. <laughs> major, major plug. Yeah. Oh, advertisement. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's one thing you realize, especially me as I get older. There's this beginning Spartan style, warrior style, like me against everybody in the world. I'm taking everyone out mm. when it comes to how you move about life. And then as you get older, you realize more and more it's about how much the more you help others mm -hmm. on your journey, the yeah. more you get. It's reciprocal by nature. Absolutely. Yeah. And you don't even realize it's happening. Yeah. And the older I get, the more I start to play in that in that specific place. So I think this introduction is going to be really good for you. And, uh, you know, it was absolutely amazing to hear your story thus far. I feel like there's so many more layers. Oh, that we can man. keep going, but I, yeah, I don't want to wear you out. But no, man. <laughs> I, got, just, I got, got lots. We got to have a round two, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, one, no one off top. For real, top. for real. I think, I think I would love to, to jump into uh, part two of this journey, <laughs> especially with a little bit more uh, developing that you're going into this next chapter of your life. So yeah, no doubt. It's going to be a... Uh, I'm, I'm vicariously going to be living through, <laughs> through the sidelines. Be like, yo, I'm seeing how this thing's going to work out. But whatever we could do to help you uh, along with the next chapter, the next phase of your life, man, it's going to be awesome. And as always, we're going to be here for the ride. So if you need something <laughs> done on the whips, uh, AJ, sure. I'm sure we'll talk to you. But, uh, Sounds like. <laughs> but yeah, man, just hit me up for anything you need there. But uh, outside of that, man, looking forward to the journey, my man. Sure. Is there anything that you want to leave on the table? Any last? I mean, there was a great moments that you talked about, the life learning moments that we all got to learn through um, in this chat. But is there something you want to leave? people that might be on a on a journey or a pathway um well i got like we have a bit of a family motto um and i think it's it's relevant to kind of the conversation so if you look at my instagram i've changed it a little bit now but i've always had where it says train keeps moving and i've had that up for the longest it was actually one of my coaches when i was in high school and what i mean by that and the reason why it was so kind of impactful for me was life goes on no matter if we want it to or not, right? Time is undefeated. It's the purpose, it's the sense of purpose you gain as you aspire down your journey. So I just kind of always have that as a reminder to me that just keep that train moving, keep going, keep hustling, keep doing everything you possibly can to live your life to the fullest potential, whatever that is for you. For me, it was professional sports. For someone else, it may be something completely different and that's completely fine. But the beauty of it is that's your journey to enjoy. That's your story to tell just keep that train moving. So I always love to bring it up when I can because it's a simple phrase. Again, it's not something like overly, you know, cliche or anything like that. But just if you always have that motor going, that hunger in your stomach to get somewhere, to go somewhere, to make something happen for yourself, your friends, your family, it's it's a never ending cycle of, of, of pushing yourself. So just keep that train moving. I love it. There it is. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of energy that you need to move a locomotion. Man. So if you can get it moving, don't you? It's gonna be hard to stop. Exactly. That's it. Exactly. So I feel it, man. You're gonna keep that thing moving. I appreciate that. AJ, you got any last things you want to say? Uh, man, actually, the only thing on my list that I that I didn't touch base on that I thought was really important that you mentioned was asking for help. So like he yeah. brought it up, you brought it up, man. Like I want to emphasize that it's not always saying like oh, like I need help in life or something like that. Even just asking for education or like, how can I be better? Like those are still helping you in some way. So it's not like, oh, I'm asking for help and I'm looking for a handout. It's like, no, I'm trying to be better myself. Yeah. Uh, that's that's huge, man. I've, I've come out of some gnarly situations and it was simply from me talking to other people mm -hmm. uh, and just learning how I can improve in like different ways or whatever it may be. And <clears throat> started feeling stagnant in life uh, going on for about like two years there and then recently just feel like I'm finally starting to like climb again and it's because Amazing. recently I started reaching out to people because I'm like hey man like how can I learn about this or what can I do there so it's like asking for help makes a big difference uh, and you don't have to look at it as like help as in like you're looking for a charity it could just be like asking for education ask for assistance wear it however you want but talk to people man like talk to people That'll help you get ahead a lot. You know, lean on lean on some other folks around you. No doubt. So, I like yeah. it. 
That was it. Much, much love, man. You're- thank you for the good, thank you for the final words, and uh, I appreciate your time, Eric Swope. <laughs> and uh, Swoper Star. Hey, how can they get a hold of you, my man? Yeah, so you can find me at Swooper Star, Swoper Star, whatever you call it. <laughs> Swooper Star eighty six. Find me on Instagram. I'm there. Hit me up. I'm starting to post more often because, again, trying to try, you know get my story out and uh, figure out how to impact the the, the, uh, the next generation. So it's gonna All be right. lit. Yeah, for sure, there for sure, is. man. Well, thanks again, man. Much appreciation. Uh, thanks for tuning in here at uh, the uh, All Wrapped Up podcast with SS Customs and our amazing panel. So tune in. Tune in next time. Much love. Deuces. Like, comment, subscribe. Goddamn. <laughs> All right.